Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd really like to thank you all for joining uh, today's webinar. Uh, this is uh, our um, uh, first webinar really looking at the role of uh, surgical research during the current COVID pandemic. Uh, my name is uh, Shiraz Marker. I'm one of the uh, academic uh, lecturers in esophageal gastric surgery at Imperial College. Uh, we do have a stellar panel with us today. I'm very uh, pleased and delighted that they all decided to join really hopefully to provide us with uh, different aspects of um, the research uh, that is currently ongoing and potentially future directions for research. So I'll introduce our, our panel members. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Patricia Silla, who is Associate Professor in Mount Sinai, uh, has several uh, academic roles, uh, but uh, also uh, primarily will talk uh, about her roles um, from a committee perspective within uh, SAGES. Uh, and we also have Professor Winter, who is a Professor of Surgery in University College Dublin and uh, Editor for BJS, um, formerly known as the British Journal of Surgery. Uh, he'll talk about the role that journals may play in directing uh, surgical research during this pandemic. Um, and we're also very privileged to have uh, Delia cortez Garal, uh, who is a digestive uh, surgeon from uh, King Khaled Hospital in Saudi Arabia and also in Madrid in Spain. Uh, and social media expert to really uh, hopefully uh, give us some new insights into how social media may um, help disseminate uh, or even produce research during this pandemic. Um, so maybe if we start with uh, Pat. Um, so how are things in New York? Well, things in New York are finally getting better. Yeah. Um, we had a, some, uh, you know, really tough time. I'm, I'm sure you all heard. So in New York City, we've uh, we've lost essentially 11, almost 11, 12,000 people. Uh, we uh, peaked around April 6. So now the curve is finally flattening in terms of hospitalizations and uh, ICU admissions. Mm -hmm. Intubation also is way down. So we still have, uh, on average, 18. We went from 18,000 admissions in our hospitals down to about 15,000. Mm -hmm. We still are, you know, admitting about 1,300 people across New York State. Okay. Um, but again, the numbers are flattening, and this is really as a result of the pause. So we went on pause or, you know, confinement on uh, essentially a month ago. That was in um, on uh, March 20th. So things are much better. Okay. From a clinical perspective, we uh, stopped elective surgeries on the 17th of March. Okay. And then okay. we went to emergency or surgery only on the 23rd. Okay. And our department of surgery has been deployed. So every single one of us, yeah. um, which is a large department, has been sent to the front line. Yeah. So I've been covering the emergency department. My colleagues have been in the ICU. We've all essentially helped out manage patients and the flow. Yeah. So we now are finally having a discussion about returning back to normal, okay. uh, which is planned hopefully by mid-May. Okay. Now, specifically, in terms of research, I can tell you that things have changed dramatically. So pretty much mid-March, as a hospital was, was coping with a surge, hmm. uh, we received a notification that all surgical research was put on hold. Okay. Uh, that yeah. means in terms of resources, our, all our research uh, assistants, coordinators, essentially have been pulled back away from their traditional uh, protocols towards COVID-19 protocols. Okay. Okay. Uh, and that was not without, without, you know, that was without our consent. It's, it was institutional-wise um, uh, move to move the research uh, resources towards COVID-19 uh, uh, protocols only. The IRB also informed us that all our protocols went put on hold. Uh, we had a bit of a conflict because when it came to cancer patients, we had ongoing clinical trials uh, for, for colon and rectal cancer. You know, we, we had to negotiate with them to say, well, we're not using your resources. We have our own resources, but this is standard of care management of cancer patients. Yeah. So they yeah. let oh. uh, likewise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, the focus has been on COVID research, yeah. Uh, yeah. surgical or not. So that has been really the experience across the United States institutions. Sure. Um, so that's that's where we are uh, in terms of uh, clinical protocols and, and clinical situation in New York City. Great, great. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, in, in Ireland at the moment, how is the uh, situation both clinically, I guess, and also in terms of your, uh, your research at the moment? Well, I'm not say, we haven't been as overwhelmed as other countries, thankfully, which is probably what you'd expect yeah. living in an island nation, I think. Um, I just had a look there to give you the exact numbers. Just under 18,000 cases in total, with about just under 800 deaths. Um, we're still seeing cases coming in, unfortunately, and many of those are coming from nursing homes. Uh, but in terms of hospitals, we have not been as badly overrun. We've shut down almost all elective activity in order to be on the front line 
exactly yeah. as Patricia said. Yeah. Uh, and we've all been redeployed in various roles according to need. Thankfully, it hasn't been too bad. Um, <clears throat> uh, regrettably, of course, the inevitable consequences have been on all of research activity, etc. So if it wasn't for some of the superb collaboratives that have started up, mm -hmm. I don't think we have a huge amount to do in that sphere. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, from a journal point of view, if anything, actually, this has stimulated a pretty huge spike in people writing. So there's a huge amount of people out there thinking and writing about COVID and the COVID implications for research and for surgery on a global scale. So that's actually very a very positive thing because I actually think that actually out of all of this misery will come a tremendous amount of positive change for the world. So actually, I'm, I'm a lot more positive than I suspect many people are out there. Okay, great. And uh, Delia, in, uh, I know in, uh, in Madrid you've had a, a lot of difficulty, but um, uh, have you had any, uh, in terms of, can you tell us a little bit about the situation, well maybe both clinically and also I guess in terms of if, if there is any ongoing research uh, in your department? Um, well, greetings from Madrid. Uh, as you know, Madrid has been one of the world epicenters of uh, this uh, nightmare of COVID pandemic for weeks with uh, 22,000 deaths. Um, all surgery here were cancelled. Uh, only very little oncologic surgery in COVID-free centers uh, has been uh, performed. But uh, here's, uh, here, uh, almost all surgical research and uh, all elective surgery has been postponed. I think um, COVID pandemic is having a huge impact on surgical patients mm. and there have been important achievements uh, in the present years, like uh, in minimal invasive surgery and robotic surgery that couldn't, shouldn't be wasted. Uh, there is a big uh, place for surgical research, I think, during COVID pandemic. Maybe in a certain way, I think it's it's the end of the surgery as we know it. Uh, this surge, as you said, uh, has caught many governments of God, but it could be unacceptable again. I think we have a lot of uh, a lot of to, uh, for research uh, during, uh, for surgical research during the pandemic uh, about safety, about uh, our, our our oncologic patients, about mortality, but especially about safety. And uh, I also think that a lot of good things uh, will come out. Uh, of this tragedy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think I'll just um, take each of you, because you're all going to cover sort of slightly different aspects, but some of them will be generic. But maybe if we start with Pat, and Pat, really, in terms of um, surgical societies, we, we've had a lot of guidelines published and a, a lot of information has, has, has really um, uh, attempted to be disseminated. But really, what do you think is the real role of surgical societies in guiding research at the current time and uh, really maybe if you could tell us a little bit about the what SAGE has been doing um, would, be, would be quite interesting at the current time as well. Yeah just, just just as you said I mean I think the the primary role of societies has been to answer questions to really navigate the unknown um, and to really provide some guidance to not just surgeons but you know surgical staff residents and even patients our our, our, our website I can tell you that we have had over 100,000 people circulate through our pages on a daily basis. So there's a tremendous thirst um, for knowledge, for information that is really um, essential to, to be able to disseminate in a safe fashion. So we have to be very careful, obviously, of fake news and, you know, on social media, I'm sure Bilia can, you know, can help us um, give us some um, perspective on what's been happening on social media. But I think it really is a role of societies primarily to uh, provide reliable and practical information for all our um, healthcare workers out there. Um, so the focus, as you know, has not been on research primarily. It's been on you know, how do you, how do we stay safe as surgeons? Uh, how do we, uh, you know, what, what PPE to wear? You know, how do we communicate with our patients with telehealth? Uh, how do we prepare for the surge? Um, the role of laparoscopy, as you know, has been a huge buzz uh, among the surgical community. It is still an ongoing debate, but, you know, safe practices, safe guidelines on how you perform laparoscopy when you can in the right patients. How do you do this and protect your team? Other big conversations have been how do we manage colorectal cancers or on other cancers? Um, obviously, I'm biased because I'm a colorectal surgeon, yeah. but all cancers during the pandemic. So this has really been what the, the societies have been focused their, their energies on. Um, and Sages has done the same. But I think now that things are starting to uh, level off a little bit, there's no question that, you know, surgical research um, needs to be uh, supported and, and embraced. Um, I think Sages has taken a bit of a lead when very early on 
you know, they felt it was important to guide the, the agenda in terms of surgical research. And they actually put out a small grant. It was not a big grant. It was a $15,000 US dollar grant, but essentially to stimulate research. And the deadline is still open for those out there. It's May 1st through the SAGE's website. And it was specifically for uh, COVID-19 related research uh, in the surgical realm to answer some questions such as, you know, the role of minimally invasive surgery, uh, oralization of the virus during, uh, during procedures, what, what we can uh, find out from a, a research perspective. So there's definitely incentive in, in, in helping shape the research agenda and, and think of topics that are relevant to our, um, to our members. Um, okay. and, but I think, you know, we need to do more. Um, I think it's going to be very important for surgical societies to define, you know, what our members want to want to hear about, what they want, what research topics they're really interested in, what will be relevant to them and their patients in the next 12, 18, 24 months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so whether it's registries, um, you know, that we all collaborate on or multi-center trial that we put to help put together. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for, for uh, societies to collaborate internationally and really put these initiatives together so they can be rolled out quickly. Um, yeah. So that's, that's where we're heading. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I completely agree. And I think in terms of one of the things that probably most positive out of this current situation is, is, collabor is collaborative networks and collaborative research that has been stimulated as a result of this. Um, in terms of uh, the societies, do you think that the? I mean, we. I think one of the problems that, um, as a as a junior academic or a young academic coming through, that we've noticed is is that we see a lot of guidelines produced by different societies in different colleges with very little cross talk between them, and sometimes we see um, uh, completely different guidelines or different, um, uh, uh, I should say, different recommendations. Um, is there? Do you think this is something that you know, should be changed, or something that possibility can be changed uh, to stimulate some cross talk between North America and Europe, for example? Well, I, I don't. I can't speak of other societies, but I can tell you, Sages has engaged EAS and AEC and the KSLs and ELSA. There's been a huge effort to try to align, um, and it's extremely important because not it's not important not only important to send the same unified message to our membership but also to share each other's experiences. So I can tell you the input that we've had from our Spanish collaborators and Italian collaborators has been invaluable. I mean, they, they saw the trend we saw <laughs> in the US weeks before. So under their guidance and from their advice and experience, we were able to really adjust our guidelines and actually stay a little bit ahead of the curve. So we were able to release some statements related to, you know, some of the new upcoming testing, you know, plasma. We had a, a statement on plasma and what the emerging uh, trials were coming along. So a lot of that information really was guided by our, by our international colleagues. So th this collaboration is very central. Okay. The conflict between guidelines is tough. I mean, I, I, you know, I think we still in the U.S. at least tend to rely on the college, just like I'm sure you do as well. So our American College of Surgeon is still, you know, the main source of, of, of valuable information. Yeah. I think SAGES has not attempted to replicate that, that information. That was not the intent of other societies replicating what ACS has done, but more addressing, you know, specialty specific information. Um, and other specialty societies are doing the same. So SSO, our surgical oncology societies are more focused on the management of cancer patients. Yeah. The colorectal societies will be more focused on issues yeah. related to transanal extraction, for example, is a big question. What do we do? Yeah. Uh, or interrectal practice. How do we resume interrectal practice? You know, we can't forget about hemorrhoids after all, you know, people are suffering at home. Yeah. Um, but I think the role of each society should be you know, to really make sure every statement that is released should be checked for consistency, at least with the college statements, I think is really important. Yeah. And, and also just address the specialty specific needs per society so that you're complementary, not uh, not in, um, you know, in opposition or, you know, or, you know, you don't want to have co in internal conflict in the messaging. Uh, that's for sure. Cool. Okay. Maybe if I could pivot to, uh, to Des. Um, so Des, I, I guess one of the things that I, I I find very interesting is really uh, different approaches of different surgical journals really at, at, at this current time and, and and you know animals and BJS have have taken quite a proactive role I think both of you actually really um, and one of the things that I really want to ask is really about uh, how do you think journals can guide surgical research during the pandemic and really uh, the second question is really this this point that um, that, that Pat made, which is really the balance between um, robust peer review and uh, uh, rapid dissemination of research. 
really. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's exactly what we've done. If we if we were to do what annals uh, annals would be the same. If we were to wait until the paper publishes, uh, it, the pandemic will have passed. You know, you would be over the majority of the problems. So what we've done is anything which is very time dependent. We've offered a number of new strategies for people. We've introduced a blog called the Cutting Edge Blog uh, com, <clears throat> which is pretty simple. It's about twelve hundred words for people to put in opinion pieces. Unfortunately, it won't be on PubMed, it won't be on Medline, but for people, that's a very rapid way of doing it because I can have that up and running within about 24 hours. Yeah. So that's very useful. I've introduced a new concept of a special letter to the editor. It's about 500 words, about five references. The advantage of that, again, is just the rapid ability to have that online uh, fairly swiftly. So we've managed to put an awful lot of the present papers are coming through are a little bit like what we saw uh, in the last century, if you like, they were small case reports, they were opinion pieces based on that, they weren't heavy on evidence, but they were important to disseminate at a really difficult time like this. Yeah. Um, so I think things like that are actually important to put into even into case reports. So we've accepted a few things on issues like pancreatitis. We One patient in, in our own hospital had a, a very unusual event where they had pneumatosis intestinalis with portal gas. Yeah. It was actually fairly fatal, but may have actually been as a result of uh, tocolizumab, as you know, one of the uh, one of the drugs that have been tried to in the in these cases. And in fact, the patient made a full recovery, which is wonderful. Um, so cases like that, where it's important to get that information out there, uh, is important. So we're doing all of those as as, as uh, innovations to try to speed things up. Yeah. Trying to find a balance, you're absolutely right, between peer review, waiting for that to go all the way out and come back. Typically, that takes between two to three weeks. Yeah. It's realistic at the moment because it's very difficult. If I were to send um, my colleagues on, online here, if I were to send all of you a paper today and ask you that I want it back in two weeks, this may not be a good time for you. you we're all busy. Despite yeah. the fact that our elective practices are gone, we have other things to do. So it's yeah. challenging and problematic. That's one of the things I think is going to change as a result of this. I think the way we do peer review could actually change. So we're doing an awful lot of it in-house. It's putting an awful lot of pressure on us as an editorial team. We've seen a huge spike in the number of papers that are coming through. People who have had a little bit of time to themselves have clearly finished off papers that they wanted. So that's, that's one of the things that's coming through. Um, I am delighted to say that the I have... A, a, got support from the owners of the journal, the British Journal of Surgery Society, the BGS Society, who will support both in a, 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 a clinical sense, but also potentially in a financial sense, that we will have a BGS commission on COVID and post-COVID surgical research and how we manage this. And that will be something which will be done on a global scale, exactly as you say. We'll be looking to our United States, um, South America, African, Asian, Australasian, right across the world, we've been looking for people to be to, to get involved in this, to actually say, how are we going to do this as a as an international community? I think that's one of the really positive things that's going to come out of this is that this is going to bring us all together. The world is actually going to shrink quite a bit. Yeah. We're going to see an awful lot more things online, of course. The digital platforms will get a lot better. Yeah. That need and drive, I suspect, is going to bring about what all of us have wanted for a long time. We've been asking for better platforms in which to do this. I think that need is going to be met very quickly now by those innovative enough to think about how to do that. The way we do education is going to get better as a result. There's going to be a challenge. One of the challenges I see is, is that where everything's becoming online, everything's becoming expensive, everything requires fairly high internet access, that's going to disadvantage a couple of billion people in the world. Yes. How we get past that problem yeah. is going to be how our generation is going to be defined. I think. It's not just how we respond to this in a response to a medical problem. It's also how do we respond to this, you know, in an ethical, responsible way to not just thinking about the ecosystem. And it's wonderful to hear the birds singing and to see smog away from big cities again. Fantastic, sure. But how are we going to actually bring all of this wonderful digital technology and platforms to yeah. a global network. That, I think, will be a significant challenge. And that's something, as I say, that we will be judged upon. And that's why it's very important to me that we have representation from all uh, parts of the world in what I hope would be a reasonable document to lead us in some way out of this. And so that wonderful 
you know, institutions like the American College of Surgeons. I was reading it there as, as Patricia was speaking there. I was reading some of their website information for that. And really is superb. If anyone hasn't done so, I think it's really worth looking at. Many of the colleges have, have done it. I really like the way the American College of Surgeons have done it. They've got separate issues in terms of clinical issues, guidance, ethical considerations, and everything. And if they read, if you read nothing other than the ethical considerations, it's a wonderful piece. Yeah. of how, to, how to, to lead ourselves out of this. And that's kind of what I think we need. We need a, a concerted, coordinated uh, way to, you know, to, to think about this on a, on a, on a truly global platform. Um, how we actually mechanize that, how we drive that is going to be really difficult. Where we get the money from, as you know, from our conversation recently is extremely difficult because I think surgical research is going to end up at the back end. We're going to end up really in trouble in terms of how we can make, make any generate any requirement for, for, for income to, to be able to drive things forward and yet and this is the irony for me and yet we are the ones in the front line we are the ones who are up front and central we're much more personally exposed than many other specialties and uh, so therefore this is something that we should actually take ownership for i think we're going to have to tool up skill up and we're going to have to really uh bite down on the stick that is that we are now being dragged very fast into a genomic era where we're going to have to be testing patients this is it's going to change the way we do things so how do these viruses affect what we do how do these viruses affect the the genesis of the diseases that we treat how do these viruses affect our ability to operate how we operate whether we should be looking at thermal use for coagulation anymore is that going to disappear in a modern age yeah. are we going to look at plumeless you know something that's smokeless uh, coagulation systems, I think we will. I think it's going to change everything, but f mostly for the better. And anyone watching this, if you were an investor out there in the, in the world, I think we'll be looking to people from that uh, that part of, 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 that, of the community. I think we could be looking at people who are individual investors or groups of investors, rather than it necessarily coming from research places, because I regret to say, I sense if I'm right, there is a turn away from the big funders in the big countries, away from surgical science, and yeah. very much a knee jerk toward virus and toward respiratory medicine, etc. And while that's understandable, I think it's a motive, and frankly, I think it's absolutely wrong because there will be more mortality and morbidity and problems and chaos, I predict, caused by the virus than the virus illness itself. No, that's great. Thank you. I, mean, I mean, these are some fantastic points, actually, and I think particularly about funding, which will definitely come to uh, uh, towards. Uh, we've got a couple of questions around that as well, which we'll get to as well. But Delia, if I could just pivot to you at this stage, and I think one of the things that has been a real re learning process for me, very much so, during this pandemic has been really uh, the potential uh, benefits, but also potentially the harm of uh, social media during uh, the pandemic as a platform disseminate for dissemination of research and also in terms of undertaking research. So maybe if you could maybe just talk to me about what you really think are the kind of, um, what is the real role of social media in, uh, in surgical research during this time? Well, I think uh, social media, it's all about immediacy and trust. Um, social media is such a powerful tool for dissemination and promoting research. Um, I think the most distinguishing element is the immediacy. Uh, there are many platforms like Twitter, uh, which is the most engaged by physicians, but um, we also have Instagram or Facebook, which are very powerful in other countries like India. One very interesting peculiarity about Twitter, it's about the idea of communities. Uh, one of the first surgical community was Somi for Surgery, which was created by Julio Mayol two, two years ago, and it's a network that groups together uh, reliable information on surgical research, surgical practice, and social behavior. And um, there are other specific communities that rose up from, uh, from SOMI for Surgery, like, for example, SOMI for Peritoneum, which I am in charge of, or uh, SOMI for Inflammatory Bowel Disease, SOMI for Breast, SOMI for HBP, etc. Um, they are like the account to visit if you are interested in uh, or want a specific information. For example, if I have a, a, a doubt or want to know about last uh, about peritoneal metastasis of colorectal origin, you can waste a lot of time and effort looking for a huge amount of information that is available mm. on Twitter. 
But if you want to, to use very effective your time, you just go to that community and you can find there uh, all the information and also you get in touch with the experts. Um, what I found fascinating is how these communities contribute to dissemination mm -hmm. of research. Uh, first, and one of the most popular uh, is sharing your article or an article you are you find interesting. So you tag the community, and if the community manager review and find adequate content, then the article is shared uh, on the community, and you can tag also or ask uh, worldwide experts immediately. You don't have to wait until the next face-to-face -face yeah. conference to ask the experts about that, 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 that issue, to have an interactive discussion. And uh, you can have immediate feedback from experts uh, that many times leads to new common projects. Um, I have a recent example. I published uh, a collaborative paper on prehabilitation uh, for patients undergoing such reduction in HIPEC. And uh, one surgeon from India found it very interesting. And now we are working together on a trial to validate some of the items of the protocol. This is just a tiny example. Uh, but second, uh, you have an already created international uh, network of experts with a willingness of global collaboration, which for me is priceless. Yeah. And you can also interact with other members of um, many societies. We are also present on, on, on Twitter, like Sages, like American College of Surgeons, like British Journal that also have a Twitter account. And as we have recently done uh, with uh, our uh, one survey on the, the impact of the, this COVID pandemic on the treatment yeah. of uh, of the surgical treatment of cancer patients, and we have uh, had responses from surgeons from 45 countries. So it also gives you the chance to promote not only service, but also uh, your trial, for example, if you are conducting a trial, so other surgeons or specialists could join and contribute uh, to your recruitment. And third, many times we also have appointments from time to time, just like now, uh, online meetings with interaction with other future users and about how to balance this rapid dissemination uh, on so the so much needed research from fake news. Um, the reason why these communities work is trust. Yeah. I mean, all people in charge of a Twitter community is an expert on in, in the field with a solid criteria uh, that's going to evaluate all the information. For example, if Professor Stephen Wexner, if he publish uh, publishes an article or if he offers a possibility for research of, or if he publishes any information, I trust him So because I know yeah. him and he has a very well-built reputation. So um, uh, I trust the content because I trust him. Uh, and now we are living in an avalanche of COVID information. There's daily a lot of information, a lot of papers. And one situation I have seen these days uh, uh, over and over again is that many times uh, someone shares an article, one surgeon shares an article with something, with some new content, with something really new about COVID uh, that sometimes is completely the opposite uh, that was said three, day, three days yeah. ago. And um, uh, the good thing about Twitter is that suddenly you have 20 experts on the field, maybe not only surgeons, but uh, pathologists or immunologists, yeah. that is, they are giving their opinion. There, um, you have answers from the best experts with a solid criteria saying, I agree, or be careful, you missed this part of the information. So um, I think that uh, uh, so many, uh, that social media maybe is not as important as an scalpel for a surgeon, but I think definitely it's an essential tool for a surgeon yeah. and could be very useful during this pandemic. Absolutely. I, I, completely, uh, I completely agree with you. I think the, the real difficulty that a lot of us uh, have found is is that there's uh, the the amount of information coming through is is, is frankly overwhelming and um, uh, you know um, sometimes I think trying to uh, the traditional model of surgical research um, is you know obviously it goes through peer review and therefore there's a certain degree of confidence if the article is published in a major surgical journal such as BJS or Annals or JAMA Surgery we we have a confidence in the article. Um, and, and the peer review process. And I think that's the difficulty, uh, to my mind, with, uh, with rapid dissemination of research on social media is that there, that process is not there uh, as such. And therefore, what you're reliant upon is expert opinion that the article is good. Is that correct? Or what do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. But you are right that it's immediate dissemination. I mean, th those days I've seen, I was writing an ar some articles about COVID and surgery, and I wanted to, to do the citation of an article I have read on Twitter, but this is not 
published yet, but I have already the information because I have seen on Twitter and it's not already yeah. published. So I mean this immediately uh, about, uh, you are right, we have an avalanche of information. It's overwhelming. Yeah. That's why I, communities are so yeah. useful because it's like a filter of information and it's given you the most important, I think, information. Yeah. And it's already uh, under the view of many, many experts. Yeah. But I think it's very useful. Sure. Sorry, Pat, are you going to jump in? You have essentially all possible venues to be able to get the information and embed it at different levels. So I think the, the, the rawest of all forms, obviously, is social media. You know, people post whatever they want. It hasn't been peer reviewed, peer reviewed. That's yeah. one aspect. But from a scientific perspective, you know, there's a couple of sites like the BioArchive. I mean, I, I use a BioArchive. My husband does as a basic scientist. But the idea is that on BioArchive, it's essentially you can put any paper out there, right? And so these are unreviewed papers coming from all around the world. It's literally in the thousands um, of, of papers being uploaded. But now they actually have had a collaboration with several papers. I think there's 10 journals that essentially have an agreement that they triage through these papers and if something catches their eyes, they actually will reach out to the authors and invite them to submit to get a formal review. So right. that kind of mechanism gives you access to raw data being published from sites, which you can take obviously at face value or not. I mean, you have to be obviously very cautious. That's one aspect. Then you have the aspect of the peer review that journals are doing their best to try to triage through all that information, right? They're trying to just analyze quickly, they're not, you know, it's not as rigorous as it normally would be because of the urgency. These papers can affect clinical care, so they need to be triaged very quickly. And yes, it can be flaws and it's impossible to confirm the data, but that's the second aspect. But I think if you want to add a level, a third level of, of, um, of validation is, uh, Delia mentioned, obviously, the expert, you know, commenting and endorsing, sort of, quote unquote, the paper, but also what I think other surgical societies can do, like ACS has done, Part of the SDS actually is peer publications where they actually make the effort every week to go and pick up some 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 articles that they validate that they think is has met a, a minimum requirement in terms of quality and these are big impact papers i mean it ranges from jama and lancet papers to even some smaller you know journals where they feel that the um, information is so valuable for example there was one that was recently published on annals that talked about a low-cost you know, system to filter uh, yeah. uh, and it was a quick, you know, one and a half page paper. But I mean, my point is they selected that paper on their list of peer review as saying, this is something that can immediately impact, you know, practice. So yeah. that could be a third level of, of validation of triaging that, that mass of papers. And so I think there's ways to really strategize to make sure that we filter that top 1% of papers in each specialty that we think could actually potentially have a clinical impact um, and still, you know, be able to live with that. Yeah, perfect. That's fantastic. I just want to uh, just uh, maybe move the discussion a little bit into another area, which is really, um, I think, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is at the moment with the pandemic, we're seeing huge amounts of dissemination of uh, research in several areas. And, and um, I think what people are really struggling with is, is really is what is what are the key questions really what are the key things that we need to know now and you know in terms of uh what do you think are uh, what do you think if you are uh, um you are all academic surgeons academic colorectal surgeons um, for your sins but ultimately uh what would you think are the uh are, are the uh, uh would be the specific one or two areas that you think people really need to focus upon in terms of research now that we need to know answers for at the current time. So maybe if I start with uh, uh, Des. Oh, that's a huge question, isn't it? Um, I, initial thoughts, I mean, we're all thinking about how do we get people back to work and how do we get people back to work in a safe way? How do we reassure a very unreassured general public out there what's safe and what's not safe? So we need better testing, don't we? I mean, the idea to me of having to actually test for the virus strikes me as uh, as not going to be something we're going to be doing in the future. We need to find a way prior to getting a vaccine, and a vaccine, I think, is at least six to nine months, if not a year or two away. And where that's the case, what we really need is some ability to be able to tell someone that they either are or are not immune to this virus. Um, how do you implement that? How do you do that from an ethics point of view? That's why I was pointing to that website earlier on. How do you do that? I mean, what do you do? How do you implement even the concept of a binary process like that, where you're either going to be positive or not? And what do we do with people? Do we label them? Do you get a tattoo? Uh, you know, it, it marginalizes those who aren't immune. 
it, it, it provides a degree of freedom to those who are immune. It, it's, it's, these are all massive challenges from a, a societal, ethical point of view alone. So the ethics is a huge issue for me in this entire arena. And how do we handle that? The next is, is how do you go back to doing any kind of clinical activity or any kind of surgical activity again? Test every patient for this. And if we test every patient for this virus, to me, why are we not testing for other things as well? Why don't we? Why have we never done routine testing for HIV? Because the event rate is low? Sure. The event rate of this is actually low, particularly when you consider it in terms of a challenge or a problem or a fatality. Um, what, what we're at the moment, if you understand what many governments are saying, is, is that there is an inevitability that most of us will be exposed to the virus. What we're trying to do is to lock down in order to reduce that being in one big spike, and it will be something uh, flatter. I'm not sure even that's something I can grasp or, or grapple with. And if that is the case, and if this is going to go on for several months or indeed several years, because this is probably closer to the flu epidemic of 1918, than it is for the MEV one we had only a few years ago. Yeah. If that's the case, then we're going to have to just get on with the world because we have, from a medical point of view, once again, an ethical requirement and need to do so. So at what level of infection are you prepared to accept or what level of risk are you prepared to accept, either in your patients, but also in what about our healthcare staff? Is it, is it okay for us to continue to expect them to work in these difficult scenarios, particularly those of us who work with anaesthetists and nurses who are really putting their, their, their bodies in the way? I mean, as surgeons, we are too, sure, but I worry more about them in terms of airway management, et cetera, and I think that's something that we need to know more about. I'm delighted to see, I just did a quick search online there, that there are lots of soft funders out there that are outside the usual institutions. There's even a large grant funding from Pfizer, the drug company. I'm not pushing them. I have no, I have no, uh, I have no conflict of interest. I have nothing to do with Pfizer whatsoever. But I, I'm really delighted to see that that is international grant, and they're not looking for an institution. They're looking for multi-institutional, multinational uh, funding, and it broadly looks like it's everything from PPE equipment to safer ways of intubating patients, safer ways of managing the airways. So, I mean, there are some of the things off the top of my head. We, we touched on initially, for anyone who wasn't online earlier, I think the days of using diathermy and smoke plume and uh, coagulation are probably over. We're, we're, we're going to have to ask of, of people that there's a better system. I think the ability to do laparoscopic surgery with better smoke evacuation and filtration systems are going to be a requirement now. For years, I've been wondering why it is in laparoscopic surgery that we allow CO2 into the atmosphere. Meanwhile, our anesthetic colleagues at the top of the table have that line uh, thing absorbing CO2. So why do they do it and why don't we? And what are, the, what are the, uh, the environmental effects of that? Well, regrettably, no one listened to me and no one's done anything about it. But I think we're now going to see CO2 being reabsorbed into good the environment, one would hope. And you'll also see virus filters, etc. Why we have allowed that to happen uh, probably says an awful lot about surgeons and our personalities, and that's something that really needs to be looked at in terms of a research need. That we have allowed ourselves to be exposed to the risks, not only of needle sticks and all of the rest, but also the risks in terms of putting your body into unusual positions, etc., and, and, and the problems that arise. But also, we've all had, particularly those of us in colorectal surgery, and we're all about that age, where we were the ones sent in to burn off the uh, warts, and we've all been exposed to condyloma uh, smoke plume. But definitely back in the days, we were barely wearing masks, let alone wearing uh, full eye goggles and smoke evacuation equipment. So we've lived through that. We've allowed that to happen. We have a policy. We have a, uh, we, if you like, we have an atmosphere where we've accepted that we have to accept that risk. I think that now has stopped overnight. This has been a change. It's a waterfall event. And yeah. where that's the case, we now need to think about how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect the staff around us? It's not just about the patients, of course. Yeah. Uh, all of those are research initiatives that need to be thought about. How do we penetrate that right down to the countries where they're going to have a hard time getting their hands on expensive equipment? Yeah, we have lots to do in a, in, in a high income environment, but how do we do that? So I'm conscious of that on a webinar where potentially this has been looked at by people in environments where they cannot afford to do so. I've worked in South America in, in, in places where you operate in the back of trucks in the middle of nowhere using what we would imagine would be equipment that would be 
unimaginable in our in our areas where you're reusing equipment, <laughs> just dipping in some antiseptic. That's yeah. what we have to do. So telling them that we're going to have uh, very fancy internet digital platforms and telling them that we need extremely um, advanced virus filters, etc., isn't realistic. So how do we do that on a global scale? So they're among the things, I don't know, I could talk about this all day long. They're among <laughs> the things as I see it uh, that are the, the, the big picture challenges, but there are many, 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 many more. Uh, and there's a, there are fantastic online resources and each of your colleges and each of your countries out there actually have fantastic resources. I've done a quick check here from USA right across Europe, United Kingdom and into uh, Australia. And some of the academic uh, input that they have is actually been fantastic. Perfect. Yeah. Great. I mean, I think that I mean, there's a extremely valid uh, and really uh, important measure. I think one of the aspects that has, uh, as you rightly say, has completely changed is the, the attitude towards staff safety, and particularly research into staff uh, staff safety will be a big thing. I think moving forward, uh, Pat, maybe if I could ask you in terms of if you had to pick out one maybe priority that you think that you want to know the answer to now, what would it be? Well, I'm still trying to digest that paper from the Lancet from the Chinese group that talked about the 20% mortality rate in COVID patients who are undergoing surgery. I, I can't, I can't cope with that paper. So, I think the number one priority would be, you know, which is really funding agnostic. It's to be able to collect, you know, information through a registry. I mean, ACS has one COVID registry to really look at the outcomes of elective and immersion surgery in our COVID patient. I think it's a priority. I mean, I completely agree with that, and I think one of the things with uh, with registry-based research is that there's always the the balance between that you're, you're collecting data after the event has uh, occurred, so you're sort of measuring the the harm to patients that has happened, rather than trying to prevent the harm. But I think the problem is is that we're in a situation now whereby uh, really maybe we we don't know enough to prevent it, so we have to measure it to start with, and then we can still look at strategies to potentially. Uh, prevent it but I think um, there's an, and you have all touched on it and I think in actual fact collaboration is very much the key word which will probably come from from all of this and I think these registries need to be shared and I think uh, people need to work together and uh, put the you know work in a collaborative fashion uh, to try to get something in a, a as a predictive output more than a um, measuring output um, so Delia maybe if I could just ask you as well what do you think are sort of the the kind of key areas that you think uh, that we need to focus on in terms of uh, of research. Well, I, I totally agree with uh, Pat, and with this, uh, the safety at the OR and uh, safety for the patients are key points. But as a surgical oncologist, I'm also very worried about our the prognosis of our oncologic patients. Uh, yeah. We are researching now about because. We don't know, and we are encouraging from the main societies, uh, like European Society of Surgical Oncology, to register adequately in the history, in the clinical history of our patients, the time of delay for surgical treatment or diagnosis or follow up. This is the only way to can evaluate and to can estimate in the future the impact of this pandemic on the prognostic uh, of our oncologic patients. Um, on the other hand, uh, we think and we are encouraging also governments and international societies to develop contingency uh, plans because uh, if it's possible, it's possible that we can have a second surge and we have to be prepared yeah. and we have to have plans prepared to warranty the, the, the treatment of, of our oncologic patients. Um, and uh, uh, I so uh, following that, I think we will have to develop new strategies to boot uh, ambulatory, to boost ambulatory surgery or early recovery after surgery programs because uh, we have to I think the way we're managing resources is going to change a lot after this pandemic. Yeah, no, absolutely and I think one of the things that um, uh, a lot of us uh, who manage cancer are, are concerned about is really is uh, the, the, the long-term effects of not only how cancer is managed during this current pandemic but also the future after after um, after the after the pandemic in terms of both development of uh, new oncological strategies that will obviously be delayed i imagine um, and uh, research into these will be hit quite sub substantially uh, but also in terms of long-term prognosis of our patients who are managed currently during this pandemic will be a will be a big issue actually i think uh, moving uh, moving forward um so i think sorry yeah go for it though sorry 
ask a question just of, 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 of you guys, of all three of you. Have, uh, has the screening programs stopped in your countries? Because in our country, I, as far as I understand it, the breast cancer screening, the bowel cancer screening, all of those screening programs will be shut down temporarily if not for the foreseeable future and it's all a little bit opaque as to when that will restart again i personally have a real ethical problem with that because if you accept if you take bowel cancer if you accept that it does reduce mortality cutting funding for a program isn't just the possibility of causing death it is definitively going to cause death and i find that ethically reprehensible i'm curious what's happening in your nations yeah, so uh, I can speak about upper GI in the UK and, and uh, very much so at the moment, uh, uh, endoscopic screening has stopped um, uh, in the absence of, you know, uh, an absolute indication such as dysphagia for uh, for investigation. And really, I think the, the thing that's uh, trying to bring it back to research, I think one of the things that we're concerned about is, is that, yes, you can audit what happens after this, but in reality, actually, what we need to do is try to, in my opinion anyway, try to predict the effects of stopping screening at this point in terms of the future so that maybe we have to think about changing our policy or trying to at least produce a, a medium term kind of policy um, based upon risk estimates, I think, ultimately. Um, Pat, I don't know if you want to jump in and say anything. Same thing. I mean, it's screening only based on severity of symptoms. So again, we're, we're looking at May to be potentially able to resume operations, but you'll have had a period of two months where things have been entirely disrupted. And he brings up, you know, other ethical issues, Des. I mean, I think you, you really nailed in the bud. We are having a big problem in certain states, including New York, of seeing tremendous disparities in outcomes of patients based on their race and ethnicity. It's a huge problem that we, know, we don't even really completely understand. It's not purely related to socioeconomic status. It's not purely related to um, insurance coverage. Uh, which obviously, you know, in the States is, is, a, is a contentious issue, it, it goes beyond. So, you know, the, the worry that I personally have, but many others have as well, is once we resume operations, how are we going to decide who gets first? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I swear about this. You know, how are you going to decide which patients, you know, gets gets treated first? Which patient gets on the, on the first screen first? And, and, and so we have to be very careful and that's why I think, you know, having guidelines and recommendations um, is, from societies is going to be very important because you can use them to call out some of the practices that you see in your hospital that may not be, you know, equitable among all patients. I really worry about the, the disparities and, and, you know, the people who have, you know, the typical advantages, you know, being put on, uh, on a priority list. Um, so we have to be very vigilant during these times because this is where uh, um, disparities, uh, gaps get wider. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, well, I think it's an interesting issue. There was a um, recent publication come from um, from uh, North America, actually, looking at uh, basically adjuvant therapy and delay to adjuvant therapy after esophageal resection. And, and you know, one of the one of the headlines from that paper was, was that a delay uh, to adjuvant therapy doesn't affect oncological outcome, but it was retrospective data, non-randomized. So I think, you know, I think there's a, there, it's important that uh, these publications. Uh, are, are disseminated, but I think that, that we have to be careful that still uh, randomized controlled trials, at least in the setting of surgical oncology, do represent an important level of evidence, which we may be distinctly lacking as we move forward. Um, I don't know, Delia, if you want to say what the situation is in terms of in Spain, in terms of screening at the moment for cancers? Well, um, in Madrid and in Spain, with an absolutely collapse of the ICU, and of the hospital, a huge shortage of beds at the ICU and at the hospitals. Uh, we know a lot about uh, COVID mortality, direct mortality, but we don't know a lot about indirect COVID mortality, um, uh, which is going to be also huge. Uh, there is no screening program. It's, it's, it's cancelled right now in Madrid uh, for uh, colonoscopy, also for breast cancer, for example. And uh, we think about surgery, which is completely cancelled. And as Pat said, the time for international societies uh, working uh, with uh, cancer, it's the time is now to work on protocols on how to who, who to screen first, who to operate on first, yeah. and it's it's going to be crucial for the next uh, weeks. It looks like in Madrid, uh, surgery for oncologic surgery will be resumed for our second week of May, but we'll see. Okay. Um, 
but for sure uh, we don't know about the impact in in our patients but i do think that we need uh, protocols about uh, on that now yeah. uh, i mean i think one of the things to maybe pivot to is our is our polls actually which are quite interesting actually at the moment so one of the first questions we asked was uh, should uh, we focus surgical research purely on covid-19 related issues at this time and interestingly, only 24% of, uh, well, I mean, I guess it's five out of 22, but they um, said yes to this. So I don't know, uh, maybe, uh, um, uh, Pat, what do you, I mean, I guess, what would be your thoughts with regards to that? Well, I mean, it could be that some of our uh, poll answers have of ongoing protocols that are not COVID and would like to finish their, uh, their research and complete it. Um, yeah. There's some chatter about, you know, you know, non-COVID patients, obviously, and other benign, uh, you know, conditions that still need investigation. So we don't want patients to suffer overall from this, you know, extended ex uh, focus on COVID. So COVID is a priority right now for a number of reasons, especially, obviously, because there's so many unknown questions. But, yeah. you know, we still have to take care of our patients and provide them with the best of care, which is heavily relying on clinical evidence. Yeah. That's, that's know, reflected yeah. by the one of the things that's a big shame is that there are some, uh, obviously, I mean, I it's exactly the same in every specialty, but there are some big trials which are sort of coming towards the end in terms of patient recruitment, which have stopped. Ultimately, we don't have the, uh, the answer. I mean, Neuroagis has been won by John Reynolds in Dublin. is a, is a massive upper GI trial, which will hugely influence our practice. Um, but uh, obviously, with the pandemic, we, we stopped. So we, don't, we, will, we won't know the answer for at least a, you know, a year or a couple of years, actually, to be honest. Um, uh, and that's, uh, I think, a real difficulty. I don't know, Des, if you have any thoughts on uh, any uh, of the out outcomes from the polls? Uh, yeah, well, it, it is fascinating, isn't it? I was, I, saw, I was more interested in the fact that people wanted to see that the process should change, that the surgical research, you know, isn't really fit for purpose in terms of how we do things and that the established model isn't a good one, that it, by 88% wanted to see a more streamlined ethics and, and, and faster access to funding. Yeah. There are things that journals can actually help with, I think, and I do think that that's where something like that BGS commission that I was talking about can be can facilitate that. I'm very attracted to the idea, Patricia said, that with documents like that that come from agencies and from government bodies and from journals and from societies, you can bring that to your local institution and say, look, we're out of step with what's going on here and you can use that. So that's empowering people. Uh, from from centrally, and I think that's actually very a very uh, a very useful thing that we can actually do. I, I suspect that when the respondents are saying that they don't necessarily wish all surgical research to be on COVID nineteen related issues, I suspect what they mean is, is they don't want it to be specifically about those disease processes. Yeah. And um, I think if we were to ask the question differently, say, should we divert some funding toward the concept of what this is doing to surgical care? In its in its bigger picture, yeah. I suspect the answer would be a more resounding yes, yeah. because everyone has a clear understanding of how this is going to affect them, how it's going to affect their patients, how it's going to affect uh, this the way we drive things forward. So, so I, I wouldn't take too much. This is the the, the challenge, difficulties we pose is that you get the response to the question that you ask, yeah. not necessarily what you want to hear or what you wanted to ask specifically. Uh, so I suspect that that's what's happening with that, that's all it is. I think we're all very, very, very keen and focused. Um, and as we were saying earlier on, I think one of the really exciting things about this is, is this is going to bring people all over the world uh, together. What's regrettable, of course, is that we can't actually do that in a physical sense. Yeah. yeah. But it's much, much harder to do it like this on an online sense and much harder for people to therefore trust one another and to work together in a collaborative way where you don't have that physical in the room setting and one hopes that this waterfall event that I as I refer to it as that this absolute huge change in the um, in, in the atmosphere will drive people toward a little more online understanding more online digital sharing with patients for example is going to help us we're going to have to do an awful lot more of this we've had to move all of our editorial meetings to online whereas before we would have had physical meetings yeah. heretofore we would have said that was something we didn't want to do we weren't interested in doing that because it was important to do face to face but actually frankly as you can see some of these platforms are actually pretty damn good and you yeah. don't lose out uh, yeah. much of the uh, emotion and, and, and eye contact and all the rest. So uh, so when that happens and as that happens, I'm, 
I, I, I'm very confident that with those fantastic global surgery type collaborative uh, things, and I see that some of the people are online at the moment, some of the people are involved in that, I think that's very much going to be the way forward. And the rapidity with which they have responded has yeah. been fantastic. The number of countries and places that are set up already, the number of patients that they have recruited already is simply extraordinary. And that is how things are going to be for the future, I predict. Uh, what we do with that information, of course, is the problem, but that will be the fuel to the fire. The fire will be what it is that we do in response to all of this. That requires a little more mature thought. That requires those of us who are in these kind of positions. Morally and ethically, we need to be more responsible about that and to have a, put the brakes on it just a little bit to think, well, okay, this is great and it's good work. It's good information. But what do we do with that as a result? And that's, I think, going to be the second wave of the surgical research, if you like, is going to be the real question. And that's for the big brains, the big thinkers, and they'll be the people I'll be calling on to help me with this commission. Okay. Great. And in terms of uh, maybe one thing, uh, just to sort of maybe uh, round it up, if I could ask, um, ask you, it's just something that I, I think a lot of people want, uh, a lot of people at my stage, I guess, sort of a um, um, junior academic coming through, is really is if you could currently give one piece of advice to, um, to, uh, surgical researchers at the current time in this pandemic uh, really what would it be at this time because obviously there's a huge amount of anxiety about uh, what so, you know, surgical conducting surgical research at this time but also what it will look like after all of this is uh, after we've been through all of this um, so maybe Delia uh, I mean you, you're a young academic yourself so maybe, maybe. Um, yes um, I think Sorry, I think, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'd like to say that uh, for me, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive, but those who can best manage uh, change. Um, I think that conventional research, in, for example, in surgical oncology takes ages. And um, with this pandemic recruitment of trials across uh, Europe, our own trials has significantly slowed down, slowed down. We have a really problem. And probably as medical oncologists, we will have to move to more efficient uh, statistical models like projection models or continuous adjustment models to evaluate uh, the real needs of uh, recruitment in a dynamic and way according to results. Um, I think it's, as Wes said, I think it's going to be really difficult to find uh, public funding if your surgical research is not related to COVID. <laughs> but that's my opinion. No, sure. Pat, what would be your advice uh, to, uh, to me, I guess? I mean, I totally agree with Delia. I think these are days that are going to call on everyone to be resourceful, resilient, and really creative. And and I think that the outside the box thinkers are going to be the ones that are going to really come up with some solutions. Um, so every everybody has to adapt, and some are going to, are going to adapt quicker than others. I think our responsibility here as leaders is going to be to try to share some of the ways we can get around these problems, you know, including funding, um, describe new models and paradigm shifts in how we can conduct research and obtain fun funding and diffuse that message widely. Um, so for example, I mean, working on documents and, and, and suggestions, you know, this is what I, I kind of like. I, I really, I'm really invested in, in that kind of effort is, for example, you know, give us some examples. So you're running a clinical trials, you know, how do, how do you amend the protocol to be able to take into account the delays in patients coming in and getting their follow-ups? Uh, how do you uh, change your enrollment policies? No, we can no longer do in-person you know, in person consenting. Can we do it all on the web? The IRB and all the ethical boards have to adjust accordingly. So it has to be a comprehensive, cohesive effort to try to adjust to the times and come up with the solutions to be able to conduct the research. And I think our, our residents and research uh, staff is really coming up with great methods to do it. And we have to be creative, and, and 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 as soon as we come up with a solution, diffusing it quickly, I think, is going to be essential. Yeah. Don't lose hope. Uh, it's going to work out. <laughs> work out. Yeah, exactly. I hope so. I hope so. Um, so thank you, uh, everyone, actually, for all of your comments, and uh, we've had a lot of interesting discussion on the chat forum. Sorry. Uh, I think uh, my colleagues have been responding to it, which has been great. Um, so maybe just to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, to summarize actually in terms of what we've been doing. So 
I, I um, uh, am one of the academic lecturers at Imperial College and myself with my colleagues became uh, uh, deeply um, um, uh, excited, interested really, and also felt that, we, as uh, Des said, that this was a watershed moment in academic surgery. So we developed this project, Pan Surge, and really what we felt was, was that there was a huge amount of information being disseminated and we tried to create an educational resource that people can utilize and potentially work in different areas. So we've undertaken and started uh, a couple of projects, uh, which I'll describe uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, so the first is really a uh, PREDICT study, which is a national, now international study actually, which is really trying to generate real-time risk prediction models uh, to inform surgical decision making. So all of this information and data will be freely available. The idea is, is that uh, anyone can use the website and anyone can use the prediction models once they're, once they're generated. And we're just working our way through the process now. As we've talked about, some of the um, processes around surgical research are a little bit um, slow, but we're getting there. And I think uh, the, 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 the study itself is very exciting. We have now over uh, 50 international centers which are participating. And hopefully, I think this will inform uh, surgical decision making in the future. Uh, next slide. And then the, the other study that's really taking off is the study called SAFE, which I, I think uh, Des really touched on and I think is very important. We talked about the physical safety of our, of our colleagues, but the completely underestimated aspect is really the psychological impact and the burnout that may potentially be seen in some of our, our anesthetic and surgical colleagues as we, as we uh, move through. So this is a study which is currently ongoing. Uh, the data is all live on the website. So if anyone wants to participate or take part, please just follow the link and take part. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, further um, webinars coming up. One is looking at uh, the workplace culture during the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, as we've touched on in this in this seminar, but I think uh, is very important uh, in terms of how we protect our staff um, during the current pandemic. And that will be on Tuesday, uh, 28th of April. Uh, next slide. And then we have one on the following day on Wednesday, the 29th of April, which is really uh, bringing together the global health experience uh, to the UK's COVID-19 response. And this is some of the aspects around policy uh, with regards to the current pandemic. Um, so uh, just, to, just to finish, I'd really like to thank uh, uh, Pat Silla, uh, Des Winter and Delia cortez Barral for all of your extremely valuable comments and I hope the, uh, the webinar has been uh, of interest and useful to everyone participating. Um, so thank you all very much and please stay safe uh, in your own uh, uh, work and also carry on the great work that everyone's doing in terms of research. Thank you very much.